Story, Reverence Chapter 1 Vatican City, Ticella and Aurora were in the presence of the Pope, the Cardinal Vicar and the Holy See's Treasurer. The secret meeting took place in the heart of the Pope's Apostolic Palace. And quite frankly, Ticella didn't like the line questioning that was directed at his wife. Are you a medium? asked the Pope in a gentle voice. No, replied Aurora. I understand that you can influence the weather, said the Pope. I was born with the mutant gene that grants me manipulation of the elements, said Aurora. Do you believe in God? asked the Pope. He wore a red cap and a white samar. I believe in a creator, replied Aurora. Excuse, said Tichala in a tactful manner, what does that have to do with the reason for this meeting? The Pope looked to the Cardinal and then returned to Tichala with a soft expression. The Church needs to be thorough with anyone we are dealing with, said the Pope. We desire to purchase Vibranium. I want to ensure that the people that we are purchasing from are of right mind. Right mind, said T. Chella. Yes, said the Pope. And are we of right mind, inquired Aurora. She wore a designer head wrap that hid her white hair, large shaded glasses were in her hand and they were for concealing the blueness of her eyes. As far as I can see, yes, replied the Pope. What do you want the vibranium for? asked Tichella. I cannot answer that and I request that you don't press further, replied the Pope. That is going to be a problem, said Tichella. We only sell vibranium once we know what use it is going to be put to. That is to avoid the metal being used in weapons. That is reasonable. But what we want to use the vibranium for is not of man, said the Pope. Inzagai will take care of the purchase. The Pope pointed to the treasurer. I'm glad that you came. It's nice to learn the truth firsthand. The Pope rose and his compatriots followed. Tichala and Aurora got up respectfully for the head of state. Six minutes later, the couple was led through a series of passages to their nondescript and tinted black Mercedes Benz. They met Shuri and the driver inside. Tichala found that Shuri was important to him and Aurora since the memory loss episode. She provided a lot of tactical information for the couple as they got back into the crime fighting roles. How did it go? asked Shuri as the car drove off. She had chestnut brown eyes and a low haircut. Her business suit belied that she was more comfortable in her role as the commander of Wakanda's commando unit. I got a few personal questions and they made a commitment to purchase the Vibranium, replied Aurora. They also want to use the Vibranium in a secret project, said Tichella. He loosened the business tie around his neck. He was dressed sharply in a tailor-made suit. And we are allowing them, asked Shuri. Tichala turned to his wife. Should we monitor them, he asked. If possible, replied Aurora. Tichala liked her quick decision-making skills. He returned to his sister. Then we'll monitor them. Well while you were hobnobbing with the Pope I received confirmation that surveillance on Soberk has intensified. Sooner or later he will bring up Raven, said Shuri. Tichala spun the name Raven in his brain because she had brought him and his wife grief. Tichala and Aurora lost a large portion of their memories due to Raven. The couple had general knowledge and memories of a few other people but specifics like childhood experiences and friends were gone. It frustrated Tichala especially since he had to lead his country with the handicap. He was not even in peak physical fitness as yet because he was building back up his body after being stranded for five months without food. Well that's good to hear, said Aurora. Tichala glanced out the window. He saw clearly through the reverse tint and he spotted a man as he walked briskly across a narrow street. Tichala recognized the man. Warning signals erupted in Tichala's mind. Stop the car, Tichala blurted. 
The Wakandan driver obeyed and the car jerked to an abrupt stop. I saw someone who shouldn't be here, said T'Challa to alert the others, and he opened his door. He's going down this way. Shuri take the car and go around the block. He turned to Aurora. Honey we have to check this out. When T'Challa alighted from the car, he realized that his appearance caused glances from passers-by and the security cameras that were on every corner. Running after the man is not a good idea, said T'Challa. Do you remember the person from somewhere, asked Aurora. I saw him in one of the files that I read last night, replied T'Challa. He walked briskly to the place that he had last seen the man. Aurora was next to T'Challa stride for stride. T'Challa caught the man's scent. He is medium height, wearing a black cap with thick black hair coming out the sides. A knapsack is on his shoulder and he's dressed in a long-sleeved blue shirt and trousers, said T'Challa. He looks like a tourist, said Aurora. Exactly, said T'Challa. T'Challa followed the scent into an alley and it ended at a back door. I lost the scent, said T'Challa. He tried to open the door but it was locked. Wait, said Aurora, and she held his arm. There is a trap door beneath us. T'Challa noticed that Aurora's eyes were glowing due to her use of the mutant abilities. I can short circuit it, said Aurora. T'Challa reached into his trouser pocket for the palm held supercomputer the Kamoyo. He used it to call Shuri. Hold your position. We may have something, said T'Challa. I'm on the other side, said Shuri. Good, said T'Challa. He focused on Aurora and then he glanced down the alley to see if anyone was following. He spotted a broken surveillance camera on the opposite wall. Get ready, said Aurora. T'Challa looked at his feet, suddenly the ground disappeared in a flash and he was falling into a tunnel. He felt Aurora's elbow brush against his. They landed on two bodies. T'Challa quickly searched one of the bodies for a pulse and there was none. This one is dead, said T'Challa. So is the other, said Aurora. Her finger rested on the man's neck. Blood flowed from a gunshot wound in the temple. T'Challa looked around. A thick wall was behind the couple and the two corridors in front of them went in opposite directions. Aurora had been checking the uniforms of the men. There's no identification, she said. Then she noticed the corridors. Do you have a scent? No, said T'Challa. I'll take the one on the right. Aurora took out her Kamoyo and contacted Shuri. Notify the Swiss guard that there has been a murder at this location. It's best you stay in position in case we need an extraction, said Aurora. T'Challa heard his sister agree to the plan and then Aurora slipped into the left corridor. T'Challa forced his mind to remember the exact specifics of the mystery man's files. He mustered a name Wolf. The tunnel was lit by a dull bulb and the walls were metallic. There were small steps that went up and down at intervals. The surveillance cameras were shattered. T'Challa heard a scuffle ahead and he cautiously ran forward. He entered a wide chamber. A containment unit was on the right and no one else was in the chamber. Help! shouted a man from inside the opened containment unit. The cylinder unit was zinc in color. A large round door was flung open to the side. T'Challa went to the entrance of the containment unit. The interior was dark and T'Challa peered into it with his night vision. A man in the similar uniform as the dead men cringed in the far corner. His bloodied hands covered his face. T'Challa took a step forward and then he felt a presence behind him. Someone shoved T'Challa with incredible strength into the containment unit and then the door was slammed shut. T'Challa turned sharply around and he pushed against the door in vain. Someone on the outside came by the small window in the door. T'Challa looked at the face and he remembered the man's identity. 
White Wolf, said Tichella. The man's eyes gave a off a red gleam and then he disappeared. Help me, said the guard in the corner. Tichella had no other choice than to aid the man or at least keep him quiet while a means of escape was formulated. The man bled from gunshot wounds to his torso. Tichella applied pressure where he could. Thank you, said the man, who are you? Tichella remembered that no one was supposed to know of the trip to the Vatican. A helping hand, said Tichella. Stay here. I'll get us out. The man coughed and said, you can't. We had something in here that was stronger than anything that you can imagine and it could not even get out of here. Tichala believed the man for some reason. He checked his kamoyo to see if it still had a signal. Damn, said Tichala since the device was dead. What was in here, asked Tichala. The man looked at him in detail. I can't tell you, said the man. Weren't there silent alarms, asked Tichala. No. We were caught unawares, replied the man. Tichala believed him. A knock on the door got Tichala's attention. He looked out the window and he saw Ororo. Tichala took up the man. Ororo opened the door, Tichala and the man exited. Did you see anyone? Tichala asked Ororo. No, she replied. A man called White Wolf did this, said Tichala. Shuri said that the Swiss guards are on their way, stated Ororo. They were holding something very powerful in here, said Tichala. We will soon find out what it was, said Ororo. Chapter 2 Ororo felt the stiffness in the air as the Pope and the Cardinal walked into the room. They didn't seem pleased over the incident much less that Ororo and Tichala had discovered their secret. Ororo and Tichala had since changed their blood-stained attire and they were in new clothes. This is a regretful incident, said the Pope. Indeed, said Ororo. What was in there? I cannot divulge that information to you, replied the Pope. I think if we cooperate in this matter, whatever was stolen will be retrieved faster, said Tichala. I still cannot consent to the request said the Pope. The presumed culprit is called White Wolf. We'll send the information on him when we return to Wakanda, said Tichala. Thank you, said the Pope. And could you keep this incident kindly to yourselves? Our offer to help in any other way is always open, said Ororo. Thank you, said the Pope graciously. Then Tichala and Ororo departed. Inside the vault, Kanga Mountains, Wakanda, Ororo held Umba loosely around his neck as he sat on the step below her. Ororo sat one step above Umba. She liked being close to Umba since he was her blood relative. He filled a lot of information gaps that Ororo had due to the memory loss. Umba was blind because his eyes emitted an invisible energy wave that killed living organisms. He wore a computerized visor that had a vertical red strip that ran along the lens. The visor gave him information on his surroundings. Aurora was crushed when she learned that the 15-year-old was once a child soldier in his father's army. He was a teenaged killer and Tichala had even trained him. Aurora drew a similarity with the X-Man X-23 who she learned was a friend. Apart from Ororo's family in Wakanda she had to deal with her friends in the X-Men. Getting to know them all over again was difficult at times and required a great deal of patience on her part. She even discovered that some the X-Men didn't even like her in the first place. Ororo surveyed the vault. The secret base was located in the Kanga mountain range. Tichala and Ororo kept exceptionally dangerous artifacts in the vault. Shuri had shown the place to her and Tichala. It was here that Tichala read the file on White Wolf. Ororo looked on as Tichala reopened the file on the giant screen monitor. The White Wolf's picture was from three years ago. He was in his early thirties. 
I met him when I infiltrated a group called the Dogs of War. It was one of my early missions as the Black Panther, said T'Challa. What are the Dogs of War? asked Umba. T'Challa turned away from the screen and he faced Ororo and Umba. The Dogs of War were an international gentleman's club. They hunted innocent people in urban areas for sport, said T'Challa. White Wolf entered it to gain information and we were allied for a while. Then I found out his true objective and we've been adversaries ever since. What was his objective? asked Ororo. She sensed that T'Challa might have thought that White Wolf was a friend when they first met. He wanted to kill another member of the club, replied T'Challa. Did he have preternatural abilities back then? asked Ororo. No, answered T'Challa. He must have got them over the years. Who knows he might have even gotten them from my mother, said Umba. Ororo remembered what she was told about the mother named Nakia Exen. The woman did not want to raise Umba and had told him so. Exen was an underworld geneticist and also a mutant. Anything is possible, said Ororo. It wouldn't hurt to contact her. You're right, said T'Challa. Can I be the one to call her, asked Umba. Sure, said T'Challa. Ten minutes later, the group teleported to their home via T'Challa's time-space sword. T'Challa and Ororo remembered most aspects of their house. Umba slept on the ground floor and couple's room was on the third. Ororo checked the time. It's late, time for bed young man, she said. You have school tomorrow. You've always wanted to say that haven't you, said Umba with a sly grin. Well kind of, said Ororo, and she patted his back. Now run along now. They both laughed at the last joke. Ororo loved that the lad had a sense of humor and he was easy going at times. She liked that he didn't need overprotection or supervision. Suddenly Ororo paused. She remembered that the memories of her youth were stolen. She had data files excerpts from a draft book that she wrote and video clips from the X-Men library that depicted her teenage days but they were not the same as the real things. The thought saddened her so she switched to a new subject. T'Challa came up behind and held her waist. He kissed her neck. What do you want to do after we send the file to the Vatican? he asked. She held his strong manly hands. I have a few ideas said Ororo. Chapter 3 The communicator woke Umba from a dream about his girlfriend Enzi. He stretched out his arm and touched the answer button on the beeping machine. Shuri's voice came on the speaker. How are you? asked Shuri. Umba lowered the volume on the communicator that was on the nightstand. I'm alone, whispered Umba. How are they? asked Shuri. Fine replied Umba. I really don't like spying on them. For the umpteen time you are not spying just keeping an eye out, excuse the pun, said Shuri. Umba and Shuri developed a strong friendship during the time T'Challa and Ororo had disappeared. Why don't you just ask them if they are having problems, inquired Umba. Do you really think that they'll admit to having problems? Umba thought about it and she was correct. You live with them. That gives you the best position to view them, said Shuri. Did you tell Ramonda as yet, asked Umba. He and the Queen Mother were not on friendly terms. She had openly stated her dislike for his Black Panther combat training. Speaking of training, T'Challa had to get back into the habit of taking him to the battle cube for courses. No I have not told mother, said Shuri, and she doesn't really need to know. Well if you think so, said Umba, and he yawned. I'm sleepy. Good night. Then he switched off the communicator. Umba lay on the bed and he recollected that he didn't give up hope during the months that T'Challa and Aurora were gone. At times he stayed in the house by himself, praying for his guardian's safe return.
Chapter 4 My name is Moriarty, said the confident and devilishly cultured voice. Is this Tichala who I am speaking to? Tichala placed the Kamoyo on speaker mode for Ororo to hear. The couple was in their bed and had just been awakened in the wee hours of the morning by someone on the international emergency line. This is Tichala. Good. I'm the one who took the item from the Vatican yesterday. My assistant White Wolf told me that he saw you there, said Moriarty. He said that you were once the best of friends, like brothers. What did you steal? asked Tichala. He noticed that Aurora had silently requested a trace done on the call from her Kamoyo. How can you steal what was already yours? asked Moriarty. I don't understand, said Tichala. I worked for the Vatican some time ago and I left my project with them. I merely took it back yesterday to improve it and this is where you come in. I want you to return the project to the Vatican for me, said Moriarty. Why me? asked Tichella. I hear that you have a rigorous scientific mind. I want to see it in action. Consider it a dry run, said Moriarty. Who are you? asked Tichella, hoping to keep the man on the line long enough for the trace to complete. A humble servant of God, replied Moriarty, who was not appreciated for his work by his associates. The item is located in do you have pen and paper? Just tell me, said Tichella. Your lovely good wife can go along. I've always liked mutants, but no one else or the deal is off, said Moriarty, and then he gave the location. Nice speaking with you, he said in finality and ended the call. Based on Tichella's calculations the trace should have been completed. We didn't get a trace, said Ororo and she showed him the results on her Kamoyo screen. Did we run out of time? asked Tichella. No. Everything ran as normal but the trace came back inclusive, replied Ororo. Tichella looked at the screen and he was amazed that Moriarty had outmaneuvered the intelligence division's tracing system. At least we know the kind of person we are dealing with, said Ororo. Yet. Yeah. He's cocky and prideful, said Tichella. He rose to put on his Black Panther uniform. What really happened between you and White Wolf? asked Ororo. Tichella froze in his tracks. The memories of the betrayal shot into his mind. He tried to kill me and I didn't see it coming, said Tichella. I completely misread him. Ororo came off the bed. When you confront him, Try not to be too emotional, said Ororo. I will try, said Tichella. Ororo rubbed his washboard abdomen. Let's get ready. The couple got dressed and then they alerted Umba of the situation. Tichella and Ororo left the house in their jet and headed for Tunisia. Ororo contacted the Vatican and informed them of Moriarty's message. Ten minutes later, the cardinal vicar came on the line. I want you stop, said the cardinal. Moriarty only wants us to retrieve the item, said Tichella. It doesn't matter. We can handle this problem ourselves. Give us the location, said the cardinal. We are helping you out. We have no interest in your item, said Ororo. You are meddling in confidential church matters, said the cardinal. With all due respect Cardinal we don't want to know about your church matters, said Ororo. We will deliver the item as soon as we get it. Over and out, said Tichella, and he ended the transmission. Ororo folded her arms. Maybe he could have told us why Moriarty worked for him instead of badgering us, she said. And why is Moriarty giving them back the item? Remember he stated that he was a servant of God. He could have been a high member in the church, said Ororo. He was also a scientist from what I gathered, said Tichella. He wants to see me in action. Test you, said Ororo. 
he may have larger plans and he'll probably pull me in if I pass this test, said Tichala. Tunisia, Tichala, and Ororo entered a crevice in the Le Kef hillside. They found a large door at the bottom of the small opening. Arabic words were written in bold at the top of the metal door that was coated in dust. May God shine on his humble child al Hajid Yuza, translated Ororo. Wow, said T. Chela. The name had triggered a memory. He worked in Europe as a scientist during the mid-1500s and disappeared soon after. I have never heard of him, said Ororo. The world doesn't know much about the influence Arab scholars had on Europe in that period, said Tichala. What did he work on? asked Ororo. Scientifically proving that there was a creator god, replied Tichala. Tichala pushed the door, he found that it required greater strength so he pushed harder. The door slid opened noisily on the stony surface. A light came on inside. Ororo passed Tichala and she entered the chamber. A medium-sized orb shined and spun in one position at the center of the chamber. On a closer inspection of the orb it was found that Greek letters and numerals were on the surface. The golden letters and numbers were not in a coherent pattern. A cryptus code, said Tichala. Like the one in front of the CIA headquarters, said Ororo. Yes said Tichella. And it's moving on anti-gravity plates. I don't know where the power source is as yet. Did your Arab scientist make this? asked Ororo. I don't know, said Tichella. Or if this is the stolen item. Moriarty wanted to test you then this must be the means, said Ororo. Tichella examined the code in detail. He took pictures of the orb with his kamoyo and the computer mapped out the codes for him. Then instinct told him that placing the codes in a flat structure was an error so he discontinued the use of the kamoyo. He had to view the code in a revolving state. Meanwhile Ororo searched the one-room chamber for clues. She translated some of the Arabic written on the walls. They were mostly the names of places. She searched for information on the names on her kamoyo. They may be a part of the code, said Tichella. I was thinking the same thing, said Ororo. Most of these places are landmarks from Sudan to Palestine. Tichella paused. He studied Moriarty's words and the inscription on the door. Child of God and servant of God, Tichella said. He touched the orb and it stopped the rotation. Servants of God in the Abrahamic religions are usually angels or prophets, said Tichella. He ran his hands over the codes and they became clearer to him. These are DNA sequences. To create what? asked Ororo. The Earth. The orb's rotation represents the planet, replied Tichella. Yuza wanted to prove that God existed, said Ororo while thinking out loud. Tichala went back to the Kamoyo and he asked it to run the code against known DNA genomes. The computer responded with DNA matches for humans, a few animals and plants. There was a fourth DNA sequence from the code that didn't match anything. The computer highlighted the unknown DNA code in red. Then there was a fifth DNA sequence that was composed of both human and the unknown code. Look at this said Tichala to Ororo. She came over and looked at the information. The last code is half human and something else, said Tichala. An idea came to him and he explained it to Ororo. Child of God and servant of God translate into human and angel. I'm assuming that the fourth DNA is that of an angel and the fifth is the union of the angel and the human DNA. Such a species is a called a Nephilim. It's possible. Moriarty may have created one for the church, said Ororo. Their kimoyos rang. Tichella answered his. You are indeed a smart fellow, said Moriarty. So is your wife. You have earned my deep respect so I will incorporate you into my plans. 
expect a call from me in the future. T'Challa glanced around for surveillance cameras. There weren't any that he could see. Ororo tapped on his shoulder and indicated with her hands that she also had Moriarty on the line. You solved the puzzle and get the prize. Tell them to take care of it, said Moriarty, and he ended the call. The orb disappeared and a baby's basket took its place. Tichella and Ororo peered into the basket that floated and they saw a sleeping infant. Oh my, said Ororo softly. Chapter 5 Vatican City, the Pope entered the room and he greeted Tichella and Ororo warmly. On this occasion the Cardinal Vicar was not invited to the meeting. Thank you for retrieving the item, said the Pope. I think that matters are too far gone to keep you in the dark. Aurora was eager for the information. The modern church exists in a world of superhuman and bizarre phenomenon occurring almost on a daily basis. My predecessor thought the superhumans were really Nephi limbs. He wanted the church to do its own research. So Moriarty was contacted. He performed the task and then left. When I came on board the project was scrapped and I took measures to keep the item a secret, said the Pope. It's a child not an item, said Ororo. I don't want to go into a theoretical debate over a label, said the Pope. I do wish that this remains a confidential matter. That depends on what you do with the child, said Tichella. Well I intend to put the child to good use for the church, said the Pope. There is another aspect that is puzzling. Where did Moriarty find the angel DNA, inquired Ororo. I'm not totally convinced that any angel DNA was involved in the experiment. That was one of the reasons for the cancellation of the project, replied the Pope. All right. Our silence will depend on the safety of the child. We might call from time to time just to verify because we also ran tests on him before we brought him to you," said Ororo. The Pope smiled and nodded. I have no problem with that. You should also ensure that your successors will not renege on the agreement," said Ororo. I'll see what I can do," said the Pope. Ororo trusted his word and the meeting ended. Story. Lady of the Light Chapter 1 Olympus, Long Island, New York The private meeting room played host to the visiting Ostur, Queen of the Elder Gods. Ostur was semi-attired in a fine purple material. An arched silver crown rested on her forehead. Star lights were in the sockets that acted as her eyes. Her alluring slender body shone in the soft light of the room. She was barefooted and silver bands were wrapped around her insteps. Ostur stared at her hostess Hera the Queen of the Olympians. Ostur noted that Hera had gone for the attire of the modern human females. The Olympian was decked out in what was considered a business suit. Hera had short golden hair and dark green eyes. Ostur was older than Hera and that gave her rank and authority over the Olympian. Why have you invited me into your home?" asked Ostur. Hira ignored the question and instead spoke a spell command. Ostur felt unseen bonds being lashed onto her arms and legs. Hira shouted another spell. The end of the spell carried the phrase I will be the new Supreme Queen. Ostur felt weakened and changed in some way, but the sensation was oddly familiar to her. I'm mortal, she realized. She had turned herself into a human once before and then changed back into her godly form. She noticed that Hera now had a spear and the goddess lunged at her. Ostur was struck by her vulnerability in the situation. She could not freeze Hera in time or transform her. Oshtur realized that she was about to die. Suddenly, Hera and the room disappeared. Ostur was in a dark place and the voice of her servant Ashake came to her. Ostur you have been betrayed, said Ashake. I'm bringing you home. No, said Ostur. Take me to Aurora. Chapter 2 Aurora, said the woman who appeared to be of mixed heritage and dressed in loose purple clothes. 
Her eyes were colorless. Thick black hair fell to her shoulders. Who are you? asked Ororo. The woman was perplexed and said, Don't you recognize me? I'm Oschur. Tichala had no recollection of the woman either. He walked to the side of Oshtur while she spoke to Ororo. You have to forgive me because I lost some of my memories. So if we met before I don't recall it. This is a problem, said Oschur. How did you get here? asked Tichala. A sheikh sent me here. Hira the queen of the Olympians made me human and attempted to kill me, replied Oschur. Tichala knew of the person. What is your connection to me? asked Ororo. I consider you one of my special ones. I have watched your ancestors for centuries, replied Oschur. You called me the Lady of the Light. And where is a sheikh? asked Tichala. In the realm of the Elder Gods. I came here so I can mount an assault on Hira, replied Oschur. Let's talk in the house, said Tichala, even though he was still suspicious of Oschur. Ororo carried the group to the grand house that was on the other side of the forest. The teenage war Dumba had gone on a mission with Shuri so Tichala and Ororo had the house to themselves. The group entered the living room. Oschur didn't like the delay and she implored the couple to strike Olympus immediately. Tichala desperately wanted to speak with Ororo alone to hear her thoughts on the woman and her request. What did you see in my ancestors that made them so special? asked Ororo. I saw purity, strength, and a spiritual connection to the earth. I admire that in humans, replied Oschur. Now can we please attack Hira before it's too late? I need to speak with someone first, said Ororo. She left and headed upstairs. Oschur turned to Tichella. How did you lose your memories? asked Oschur. We don't know really. Just that a being called Thanos and a human name Raven were responsible, replied Tichella. I have heard of Thanos but not this Raven, said Oschur. Aren't you doing anything to rectify the problem? Yes, replied Tichella. Oschur strode up to him. Help me, she said, and I will try to restore your memories. Tichella looked at her blankly. I don't trust you enough to agree to anything, said Tichella. This is bizarre. Here I am the queen of the elder gods and I'm at the mercy of a human's kindness, said Oschur. If you are indeed the queen of the elders' gods then you know of Balthazar, said Tichella. Of course, said Oschur. But he has returned to earth. Balthazar protects Raven, said Tichella. Can you remove him? Oschur's body language changed. She was no longer the confident person. I will have to discuss it with the tribunal leader, said Oschur. Who? asked Tichella. He was one of the lords of the light that built Balthazar, replied Oschur. Can you explain who these lords of the light are? They are interdimensional beings and are older than me, said Oschur. The tribunal leader is the father of my son Dolthro. Where is your son? In punishment for a crime he committed against me. Oschur looked to the door that Ororo had departed through. Where has Ororo gone? asked Oschur. I don't know, said Tichella, but she will be back. In the meantime we can check out the defenses of Olympus. House computer on, said Tichella, and the house's AI computer was activated. Project security package Olympus. A holographic portrayal of Olympus appeared in front of Tichella. The three-dimensional layout depicted Olympus's terrain and locations of specific denizens. The information was collected by the Secret Service over the years. Olympus is a mountain city that sits in the Bay of Long Island, New York, said Tichella. The waters are protected by Poseidon. The outer perimeter is the home of Artemis the Huntress. Apollo and the North Wind are on the outskirts of the city. 
An unknown number of forces are housed within the city itself. Then there is Zeus and Hera. Are you positively sure that it was Hera who turned you into a human? You sound afraid, said Ostur. I'm not afraid. Looking at the bios of some of these so-called gods they appear to be shapeshifters, said Tichala. Anyone could have impersonated Hera. It was her, said Ostur vehemently. Tichala stared at her passively. Are you proficient with weapons? asked Tichala. What does that have to with anything? countered Ostur. I will not send my army into Olympus. It will have to be the three of us. Since you are human I want to know that you can handle yourself in a battle, Tichala explained. There is no time, said Ostur. We must move swiftly before Hera can react. Ostur turned to the door and walked over to it. Where is Aurora? Tichala quickly got in front of Ostur. She will be back, he said. She stared at him with a vexed expression and then she returned to the center of the room. Chapter 3 Aurora multitasked as she changed into new clothes and did a search on her draft ebook that contained some of her life stories. The search word was Ostur. Nothing came up. Aurora's backup plan was to call her grandmother in Kenya. Aurora had visited the grandmother once since the memory lost incident. Aurora called the lady via her kamoyo. The grandmother's warm voice came over the receiver. Aurora pictured a woman in her late sixties with blue eyes and with her white hair cut low. Grandmother, said Aurora. My child, said the grandmother happily. Are you busy? asked Aurora. Never for you dear. Do you know of Ostur? asked Aurora. Yes. She is in my house. She claims that the Olympian queen goddess Hera turned her into a human. Is that possible? The grandmother took a short pause. Honestly I don't know how the power scale works in the other realms. It could be possible. Also have you ever seen Ostur? asked Aurora. Not in the flesh but you have, said the grandmother. Oh, I see. You don't remember. Exactly, said Aurora. I can't verify that the person is actually the real Ostur. You have to go with your instincts then, said the grandmother. I had a feeling that you would say that, said Aurora. Thanks anyway. And how is my grandson? Umba is fine. His mother wants to keep him for a while, replied Aurora. His mother, said the grandmother and her voice grew hot. I want to meet this woman. Aurora was stunned. I can arrange it, said Aurora. Thank you and don't send that precious child to live with that woman until I speak with her. Okay darling, said the grandmother. Tichala and I share your concerns, said Aurora. We are looking into the mother's recent activities to see if she is fit for the responsibility. The grandmother was quite upset. When can I meet her? Soon, replied Aurora. Thank you, said the grandmother. I have to go now. Call again at any time, said the grandmother. Aurora ended the call. That certainly didn't go as planned, Aurora said. Then she headed downstairs. All the while she contemplated on whether to help Ostur or not. When Aurora arrived in the living room, Ostur greeted her with a look of expectation. Aurora sensed genuine desperation in Ostur. It was enough to sway Aurora's decision. We will help you, said Aurora. Finally you understand said Ostur. Aurora turned to Tichala and the hologram of Olympus. Have you come up with a strategy, asked Aurora. I was thinking of teleporting us into the city and working our way into the inner halls to find Hera, replied Tichala. The problem with the plan is the risk of discovery is very high. I have another option, said Aurora while she examined the hologram in detail. 
Her focus was on Zeus's bio. We can teleport into the main plaza of the city and I'll challenge Zeus. That should draw out all the inhabitants and then you can deal with Hera while everyone is distracted. Hold on, said Ostur. You cannot challenge Zeus in a direct fight, he'll crush you. Aurora looked at her with confidence. It will depend on the manner in which I challenge him. He and I are energy manipulators so I will be able to hold my own for a while. I don't want to sacrifice you in this battle, said Ostur. Aurora was touched by Ostur's compassion. I trust that Tichala will do his part right and in so doing I will be safe. With any luck we can get Zeus to force Hera into changing you back, said Aurora. She turned to her husband. I'll continue from here. You can go and change. All right, said Tichella. We will also need to pick up the glove and the cosmic absorber in the vault. We can also use Throb, said Aurora, since it can absorb force. It can protect Ostur while you are occupied. Tichella agreed and departed. What is Throb? asked Ostur. Throb stands for Transhuman Robot replied Aurora. It has a vibranium skeleton covered with plastic flesh. I'm not familiar with robots, said Ostur. But I'll take your word that it can protect me. Ostur went closer to Aurora. What made you decide to help me, asked Ostur. It's complicated but in the end I believe your story, replied Aurora. Ostur touched her face. And I believe in you, said Ostur. Tichala returned in his ceremonial Black Panther uniform and his time-space sword. Ready to go, asked Tichala. Yes, replied Aurora. She focused on a perplexed Ostur. We are going to the vault. I understand, said Ostur. Tichala told the sword's computers to send the group to the vault. In nanoseconds the group was atomically transferred to the secret base in Wakanda's Kanga Mountains. The vault was dimly lit and Tichala turned on the rest of the lights. A giant flat computer screen was on the left wall. The rest of the chamber contained tables and Omega-level items. The Omega-level items were placed in transparent cases that were sealed with combination locks. Follow me, said Ororo to Ostur. Aurora went to the ten feet tall throb. The robot was red in color and slender. The face resembled a traditional African war mask. The eyes were a dead yellow and a frightful stare came from the giant. Why is the face like that? asked Ostur. The robot was intended to protect Wakanda's vibranium mound. The face was to terrify intruders, replied Aurora. So why isn't it guarding the mound? asked Ostur. The machine was defective. It increases in size and strength in proportion to the amount of force that it absorbs. Eventually the machine would explode from too much force absorption. Tichala made some modifications to it to stop the problem and we have kept it here ever since. Why not put it back to work? inquired Ostur. We have better robots to protect the mound. Invisible ones, replied Aurora. Tichala came over with the glove and a box that contained the cosmic absorber. The sword was magnetized to his back. The glove was an oversized mechanized contraption that resembled a hand. Three gold bolts stood out on top of the weapon. What will that do? asked Ostur. Knock out a god, replied Tichala. Where did you get such a thing? asked Ostur. I built it, replied Tichala in a casual manner. He placed the box on the floor and opened it. The golden cosmic absorber consisted of a McDuffie connector that was attached to two arm and leg cuffs and a chest box. This, said Tichala, will drain the cosmic power of any one of the gods. We can use it to bring Hera down a level and give us leverage to force her hand. Brilliant. And you built this also, asked Ostur. Yes, replied. 
Ostur turned to Aurora. Then we have all that we need, said Ostur. T'Challa closed the box. He remembered something that Ostur had said. Why didn't you go to your son's father for help, this tribunal leader, asked T'Challa. He and I are not on speaking terms right now, replied Ostur. Why is that, asked Aurora. He wants me to do something that I disagree with, responded Ostur. Like what, probed Aurora. It's complicated. Can we go now? All right, said Aurora. Aurora opened the throbs case. She took out her kamoyo and then she touched a few of the screen keys. Throb's eyes illuminated and its fingers moved. The robot strode out of the case. Aurora brought Ostur directly in front of the machine. Throb you are to protect this woman, said Aurora. As you command, said Throb. Meanwhile, T'Challa placed the cosmic absorber gear on his body. Honey he said to Aurora. We should give Ostur a weapon. I'll give her a sonic wave cannon, said Aurora. Aurora got one from a cabinet. The weapon was small and relatively light. Aurora demonstrated it to Ostur. You hold it like this, said Aurora. She placed one finger inside the trigger guard and her next hand held up the barrel. And you point and shoot. Aurora pointed at two buttons above the trigger guard. Press the green button when you want to use the weapon. Press the blue button and the weapon will not fire. I understand, said Ostur. To be honest I find this experience as a human to be very enlightening. I'm actually feeling fear of failure. Fear keeps you from endangering yourself too much. It is not always a bad thing, said Aurora. Overcoming fear also makes you stronger. T'Challa was finished with the cosmic absorber. He placed the glove into the box. Then the group departed from the vault. Chapter 4 Olympus Hera was in a rotten state as she contemplated on her next move. With Ostur still alive then Hera was afraid to take the mantle of Supreme Queen. Her accomplice Moriarty was impatient with the delay. He wore a monk's clothes which had a hood that hid his face. Are you going to stay here and worry? asked Moriarty in a cultured voice. I gave you the means of becoming Supreme Queen. You must take charge now. Hira glared at him. She was still unsure what exactly he was. He was not human or an immortal. He had displayed a vast knowledge of the realms and earth and his power level astounded her. We cannot rush this, said Hira. Ostur was feared by her followers. I must carry her dead body as proof that she is dead. Without it the followers will revolt against me. And the plan was for me absorb her powers. I didn't so how can I face the followers and Zeus? Zeus is not a problem. I can handle him, said Moriarty. I hope you are not just idly boasting, said Hira. I will be back shortly, said Moriarty. Be ready to take the position. Moriarty teleported out of the room. Hira looked around the rest of the gilded living space. Her power lust had brought her to the present predicament. Moriarty had demonstrated to her that it was possible to challenge Ostur's reign and to hurt Zeus. Hira hated her husband deeply. He abused her both physically and verbally, even in front of their children and the royal court. Then there were the affairs that Zeus committed. Hera stayed in the marriage because of the rank that it gave her. Hera left the room and headed for the balcony. There she saw another object of her hatred humans. She surveyed the inland country that contained humans. Her eyes then fell on Poseidon as he patrolled the waters around the mountain. He was half the size of the mountain city and the trident was in his hand. Hera's attention turned to the inner court of the archaic city. The architecture irked her. She had implored Zeus to modernize the appearance of the city, 
but he insisted on the old mortar and stone buildings when he recreated Olympus near the United States. Zeus came into her sight. He stood near the fountain in the plaza. He spoke with a nymph who probably came up through the underground passageway that led to the sea. Zeus was barrel-chested and stood in all his male glory. His curly red beard hung from his squared chin. The nymph blushed as she listened to Zeus. Her golden hair sparked in the sunlight and her young face radiated. Zeus held her cheek and she ran her hand along his hairy arm. Hera couldn't look any longer at the infidelity. She returned to the room and slammed the balcony door shut. The sound that was made rang in her ears. She brushed her forehead against the door and sighed. How dare you come here, boomed Zeus's boorish voice and it echoed everywhere. Hera opened the doors and stepped back onto the balcony. She looked into the plaza and she saw Moriarty as he faced Zeus. Zeus suddenly collapsed and the nymph screamed. Moriarty turned to the nymph and she exploded into pieces. Then Moriarty and a paralyzed Zeus disappeared. He did it, said Hera. Apollo appeared in the plaza and he was followed by others. Hera teleported into the plaza. She had to stamp her authority. Where is father? asked Apollo. He was Hera's sentence was cut short by the appearance of Tichala, Ororo, Ostur, and Throb in the plaza. Hera pointed to Ostur. Seize her, said Hera. She and these other strangers have taken your father. Chapter 5 Ororo We need to go Ariel, said Tichala. At once, Ororo lifted the group in a great gust. They cleared the city and were headed for the clouds. From what I heard apparently Zeus is not there, said Tichala. So what do we do now, asked Ostur. We use Throb to distract the gods while we get Hera, replied Ororo. Tichala looked on as Ororo sent lightning from her hands into the robot. Immediately Throb grew in size and mass. I'll drop him and then we will go down, said Ororo. A moment later, Throb was released and he plummeted into the plaza. The various gods swarmed onto the machine and he grew into a giant. The group swept down in the melee. Tichala used his hypervision to locate Hera. She is at 12 o'clock, said Tichala. You take lead and draw out her powers, said Ororo. All right, said Tichala. Ororo pushed him forward on an independent wind current. He went directly over Hira. She looked at him and channeled a blast of atomic energy from her hands. The cosmic absorber locked onto the atomic power and pulled it in. Hira lost control of her powers and was drained of it. Tichala landed in a crouched position next to Hira. She stared at him. The perfect distraction, thought Tichala. Hira had taken her eyes off of Ororo and the Wind Rider punched the goddess down with a lightning bolt. Tichala opened the box that he carried and he placed the glove on his right hand. He heard a male and female on his right side. Apollo and his sister Artemis were headed over to the scene to protect their queen. Tichala turned on the glove and he leapt at Apollo, punching the god in the face. Artemis had passed Tichala and she turned on him with an odd-shaped sword. The sword's blade sliced off piece of the cosmic absorber's arm cuff. Apollo was sent meters away Tichala. The Black Panther gathered himself and he drew his sword. The nano-robot sheathing peeled away into the hilt and a thick dark force energy blade emerged. Artemis swung at him. Her god speed got the better of Tichala and he barely escaped a decapitation. The longer I stay in this fight the closer she will get to killing me, thought Tichala. He leapt over Artemis. She darted the sword into him and he blocked it, but her strength knocked him off balance and he landed awkwardly almost twisting his ankle. He heard brutish dog barks. Out the corner of his eye, he saw two large dogs lunging at him. Tichala lashed one dog away with the glove and he kicked the other in the face. But there were more dogs Artemis's hunting dogs. 
the creatures were large as grizzly bears and ferocious as jackals. Three more dogs came at Tichala and he heard Artemis's heavy breathing as she attacked him. Tichala recognized that it was a coordinated assault. The dogs flanked him on the right and Artemis on the left. Tichala took a quick deep breath as the trap closed on him. He used his hyper senses of hearing and smell to locate the dogs so he turned away from them. He parried the beast's attack with the glove without looking at them as his focus was on blocking Artemis's sword blows. The dogs yelped from the punches they received and Artemis grunted as she swung her sword at different angles to cut Tichala. Then with an exquisite piece of timing, Tichala performed a scorpion kick into Artemis's face. She lost her footing and fell back. The first two dogs rushed into Tichala and he slashed at them blindly. The rapid beats of Artemis's heart returned, this time from above. Tichala glanced up and he saw that Artemis had leapt high into the air and she descended with a bow and arrow aimed at him. Where did she get a bow? Then Tichala realized that the bow was the odd-shaped sword that Artemis used. The metal was flexible since Artemis pulled on a string of light that forced the ends of the weapon backwards. The arrowhead glowed and it broke into three separate arrows upon release. Tichala somersaulted out of the line of fire but one arrow caught him in the right shoulder. He felt no pain due to the level of adrenaline in his body. He kept his focus on Artemis. She landed with a thud. Slowly, Tichala's vision blurred. The dogs were returning their savage growls filled his ears. His body felt cold and then his world went black. Chapter 6 Ororo and Ostura landed over Hira. The goddess tried to stand and Ororo knocked her down with a concentrated pressure dome. Ostura was impressed by Ororo's skill and fearlessness. Then a strange noise drowned out the shouts of the gods. Ostura turned upwards at the colossal throb. The robot was decapitated and its head rolled off the shoulder and fell in her direction. Ororo, shouted Ostur as the shadow of the head came over them. Throb's giant yellow eyes seemed to focus on her. Ororo didn't respond to Ostur's call. Ostur turned back to find out why and to her horror Ororo had been transmutated into a statue of lush green plants. Ororo, shouted Ostur. Suddenly the ground lost its solidity and it whirled like a maelstrom. Ostur, Ororo, and Hira were swallowed up. Ostur dropped into a subterranean chamber. She looked towards the ceiling and saw that it was intact. She got onto her feet and she realized that Hira was already up. Ororo was on the floor. Hira and Ostur stared at each other for a moment. What did you do to Ororo? asked Ostur. I did nothing, said Hira. Moriarty strode into the view of the goddess and the human. I did that and I brought you down here. Kill her now, said Hira. Ostur armed the cannon but it was ripped from her hands by an unseen force. The weapon was dissembled before her eyes. Kill her Moriarty, said Hira. Ostur was lifted off the ground and she flew into Moriarty's grasp. He held her by the throat. A force kept her paralyzed. She tried to see what was under the hood without success. I cannot kill her now, said Moriarty. The tribunal leader is on his way to this dimension. Ostur's heart leapt when she heard that her mate was near. How do you know that? asked Hira. Because he told me, replied Moriarty. Ostur didn't like the tone of Moriarty's voice. It sounded like Moriarty and the tribunal leader were allies. He is coming for you, Ostur, said Moriarty, and he shook Ostur lightly. She remembered the last conversation that she had with the tribunal leader. They had fought because she didn't want to follow him. Who are you? asked Ostur. I am the savior of your kind from the damnation that shall come, replied Moriarty. Hira came up to Moriarty. What about our plan? asked Hira. Where is Zeus? Gather your people, 
tell them that you are waiting on a sign from the tribunal leader. That Zeus will appear soon. The tribunal leader will take charge in Ostur's absence and he will lead all of you. Follow his instructions, said Moriarty. He moved Ostur's face from side to side. I didn't know that you captivated him so much. I can use that. What will you do with Aurora and her husband, asked Ostur. They were always in my plan, they earned it, replied Moriarty. I have already sent Tichala through. Ostur was totally confused. How did he know Aurora and Tichala? What did the tribunal leader have to do with it? What are you planning to do? Not planning my dear. This was started over 800 years ago. I call it the Spiria Project, replied Moriarty. Moriarty turned to Hira. Farewell, he said. Then he disappeared along with Aurora. Next story, the Spiria Project prologue somewhere in the ether 100 beings gathered for a council. They are all gone, was the chorus in the group. Where did they go, was the main question. Moriarty will know. Someone suggested. Then we will seek him out, was the consensus. Chapter 1 The pronounced Antarctic temperature wrapped itself like a coat around Aurora. Despite her normal tendency to be unaffected by nature's elements the frigid cold felt like needles on her skin. She rubbed her hands and arms to warm them. She felt a small fragment in her white hair. Upon investigating with her thin fingers she found a piece of debris from Olympus. Her thoughts went back to the moment when she had Hera in her sights and then everything went dark. Her night vision turned on automatically as she surveyed her new surroundings. Darkness encircled her and when she looked down she realized that a plate of ice was underneath her feet. She snapped her fingers to trigger a spark of lightning and nothing happened her mutant abilities were nullified. Where am I? That must be the most pressing question in your mind right now, said a confident male voice that invaded the silence and it came from above. Aurora recognized the smooth cultured voice. Moriarty, she said. She looked up and her heart skipped a beat when she saw two large yellow orbs that glowed and stared down at her. The orbs were Moriarty's eyes. My word, muttered Aurora in wonderment. The glow from the orbs intensified, and she saw the impressions of a darkened face around the eyes. A scrutinizing brow arched on the forehead. Curly grey locks were around the edges of the face. Aurora made out the nostrils, mouth, and chin. Moriarty's arms extended out of a well-defined chest that seemed to be covered with dark fur. Both arms rested on his thighs as he knelt. There was a slight movement to the back of him. The movement continued and it became apparent that the disturbance was caused by a wing that was covered in fur. My God, said Aurora as she looked at a being that was as tall as the Statue of Liberty. Please do not use that expression so freely, said Moriarty. What are you? asked Aurora. The human term is angel, but I'm not the warm and cuddly things portrayed on Earth. I prefer to call myself a second-tier being," replied Moriarty. Don't you want to know where your spouse and friend are? Indeed Aurora wanted to know where she was likewise the location of Tichala and Ostur. But she was so caught off guard by the shock of Moriarty's identity that words were hard to form. You are in Spiria, said Moriarty. Your husband is being greeted elsewhere and Ostur is safe for now. Aurora remembered her last encounter with Moriarty. She suspected that Tichala was with the White Wolf who was a henchman for Moriarty. She also recalled a promise Moriarty made to the couple. Is this your scheme that Tichala and I were intended for? asked Aurora, as she eased up to her captor. The sound of ice being crushed under her heels resounded so much that she stopped. She realized that Moriarty was odorless and the texture of his features in the yellow glow exuded a brawny image. Yes, replied Moriarty. What is this place? asked Aurora. Not what? Where, 
clarified Moriarty. Spiria is on the other side of the multiverses. Aurora looked at him perplexed. She knew about the multiverses, those splices of dimensions that seemed to run into infinity, if such a thing was possible. Tichala and you are going to help in my work, said Moriarty. Which would be, asked Aurora. Assisting with my study of the third tier creatures, replied Moriarty. We never agreed to such a thing. Release us, said Aurora. Aurora I'm allowing you to do this by your own free will, but I can also make you do it, warned Moriarty. The shock wore off of Aurora and her strong will came to the fore as her tone of voice changed. What of Ostur and Hira? Ostur was a problem and Hira was the solution. I don't understand. Ostur was supposed to bring all of the Earth's third-tier creatures here but she ignored the tribunal leader's order. So I removed her. That is all. You ruined her life for this. I was forced to. Had the tribunal leader been more persuasive then no misery would have befallen on Ostur. Why is the tribunal leader so important? He commanded the fear and respect of all the third-tier creatures, replied Moriarty. I required his influence for my plan. Why do these things, asked Aurora as she walked to the side. Based on the information I received while on Earth, I decided to act now. Aurora remembered that Moriarty was known by two popes of Rome. You were in the Vatican. Yes. That is where I got the information from, replied Moriarty. I dwell there in human disguise from time to time. You are also a murderer. As far as I know that makes you one of the fallen angels, said Aurora. I'm different from those who fell and those who stayed, said Moriarty. He sounded annoyed to Aurora. So you may like to think, said Aurora. Moriarty was visibly upset by being called a fallen angel. His cheekbones sunk and he clenched his fists. It's time to reunite with Tichala, said Moriarty. Moriarty stretched out his wings like a great bird and he rose. He took Storm into his right hand and then flew off. The angel's eyes illuminated pieces of Spiria for Aurora. She saw several cocoon-like objects that floated in rings. At one point the glow of Moriarty's eyes invaded the surface of a cocoon and Aurora believed that she saw a body inside of the transparent upper shell. The place felt like death to her. She wondered what kind of state Ostur was in since most likely the Lady of the Light would be the key in escaping the prison that they were in. As for Moriarty being an angel Aurora recounted conservations with her friend Nightcrawler who was a deeply spiritual man. He told her stories about heaven and the angels which she believed. She was sure that Nightcrawler would have been delighted to speak directly with an angel. It was unfortunate that Moriarty was her first contact with an angel. Chapter 2 Tichala opened his eyes ready to deal with the goddess of the hunt. He soon discovered that his sword, the glove, and the cosmic absorber were absent from his body. He pulled off his mask and a blast of cold air struck him, the rest of his body was protected by the Black Panther ceremonial suit. His night vision allowed him to see and then he held a familiar scent. The origin of the scent was a man who stood at the other end of the plate of ice that Tichala was on. Tichala recognized the man's bearded face and wild eyes. A marble-sized orb glowed and floated next to the man's head. White Wolf thought Tichella. Finally you are up, said White Wolf in a smooth voice. Now we can settle an old score. Where are my weapons? asked Tichella. I have them in a safe place. But you will not need them again. Plus they will fetch a high price when I sell the technology on the market, said White Wolf. White Wolf leapt several meters into the air and he descended over Tichella. The Black Panther dodged to his right. White Wolf stomped onto the surface and went into a martial arts stance. Tichala remembered bits and pieces of his association with White Wolf. 
he recalled that they once were friends until White Wolf betrayed him. T'Challa attacked his opponent with rapid strikes to vital points. A fluent White Wolf eluded the Black Panther's punches and made a high kick into T'Challa's right shoulder. A sharp pain traveled from the shoulder to T'Challa's brain. He forgot about the wound from the goddess's arrow and White Wolf exploited the weakness. T'Challa and White Wolf traded blows, then T'Challa lashed his foot into his opponent's jaw. White Wolf staggered back and spat. I see that we are still evenly matched, said White Wolf. T'Challa sensed great movement in the darkness behind White Wolf. Then Moriarty appeared like a bullet exploding out of a gun. The angel circled the men and then knelt on one knee next to his henchman. T'Challa looked up in awe and he saw Aurora in Moriarty's hand. Moriarty placed her next to T'Challa. Aurora quickly put her lips to T'Challa's ear as she hugged him. Moriarty is an angel and he has Ostur somewhere. We need to get to her and then plan an escape, whispered Aurora. Then she went to the side and stared at White Wolf. Nice to meet you, said White Wolf as he retuned Storm's stare. I'm an old friend of T'Challa. I already knew that, rebuffed Aurora. Why did you attack T'Challa, asked Moriarty. I wasn't going to hurt him, too badly replied White Wolf, and he folded his arms. T'Challa I suspect that you know who I am by now, said Moriarty. I have to admit that I didn't expect such a form, said T'Challa. And I guess that you took us from Olympus. You guessed correctly, replied Moriarty. He wants us to assist him with his research on what he calls the third tier creatures, interjected Aurora. It is much more complicated than that, admitted Moriarty. I also want to wake up a few of the creatures and have them live here with us. What are they? asked T'Challa. You know them commonly as gods like the Asgardians, replied Moriarty. You are going to research them from here, asked T'Challa as he looked into Moriarty's eyes. I have already brought them here, replied Moriarty and continued. A war is coming between the creator and his adversary. I don't wish to be a part of that conflict and I knew that the third tier creatures would be decimated in the war. That's the reason I saved them. T'Challa was stumped when he heard about the creator. He had long speculated that there was a designer of the universe. Confirmation that his beliefs were true caused a slight stir in him. Does the creator know about your project? asked T'Challa. What do you think? countered Moriarty. And why is the White Wolf with you? probed T'Challa, and he cast a hard stare at his adversary. I was in the right place at the right time, stated White Wolf proudly. White Wolf is my contact on Earth, explained Moriarty. T'Challa found that interesting, but he had to refocus and stick to Aurora's plan. We must see Ostur, he demanded. What for? asked Moriarty. To ensure that she has not been harmed, replied Aurora vehemently. I see that her well-being will affect your desire to work freely with me, so you will see her, said Moriarty. He extended his arm and another plate of ice appeared from the darkness and it connected to the first one. An ice prison was in the middle of the new platform. The prison was circular, six feet four inches tall and small in room size. T'Challa noticed Ostur's long black and loose purple clothing. She is in there, T'Challa thought. He ran to the prison, and he punched a few of the bars with all his strength. The bars wouldn't budge. Maybe Aurora can break them quickly, thought T'Challa. He turned around and saw that his wife ran with her hands extended but nothing happened, her powers were gone. T'Challa, said Ostur. We will try to get you out, said T'Challa. Are you hurt? Only my heart, replied Ostur. What do you mean, asked T'Challa. The tribunal leader is in league with Moriarty, answered Ostur. And have you seen Moriarty? 
Do you know where he is and what is this place? Yes, responded Tichella, and he pointed out the angel. Ostur's colorless eyes gazed in the direction. Disbelief was etched onto Ostur's face when she saw Moriarty. That's the reason that he seemed different, said Ostur. I have seen his kind before on Earth. He wants us to assist him in studying the third tier creatures. I think that means your species, said Tichella. Ororo finally arrived at the prison. She tried to push her hands through the spaces between the bars and was unable to. We will find a way to free you, said Ororo defiantly. Moriarty told me everything. He wanted you gone so he could get the others here. What did he say about the tribunal leader, asked Ostur. That he was the main target. I think Moriarty may have tricked him, replied Ororo. I sincerely hope that was what happened, said Ostur. Moriarty and White Wolf came to the prison. Tichala drew his claws, he quickly ran to Moriarty and somersaulted onto his thigh and then arm. With a great leap, Tichala reached Moriarty's left eye and made to slash it with his claws. However, an unseen force held Tichala in mid-air. You disappoint me, said Moriarty. Here you are at the very place where most humans want to be. You can ask me any question that relates why and how you were created and who is the creator? And I will readily answer. Instead you toil with feeble attempts of escape. al hajid Yuza was so different. He was here, asked Tichella. He was familiar with the work of the 17th century scientist. Of course, he was my assistant until he died, replied Moriarty. Tichala was lowered haplessly back to Ororo's side. Moriarty continued, Ostur is all right. She will stay that way unless something happens to change my mind. But why imprison her? She is human like us and can't pose a threat, said Ororo. I have my reasons, said Moriarty. I want to know them, said Ororo sternly. Moriarty sighed. One reason is that she escaped from Hira even though she was in human form, so I have created a prison that will keep her, he replied. Why didn't you kill me when the chance was there? Why do you need me for the tribunal leader, asked Ostur. As expected, the tribunal leader wanted to search for you after he took control over leadership of your kind. I told him that I found you and gave him a glimpse of this place. I was able to capture him when he came. I don't understand why the tribunal leader would follow you, said Tichella. I told him that the multiverses that he watched over were to be destroyed by the creator and he should send his kind to a safe place, said Moriarty. Which was here, said Ororo. Correct, said Moriarty. I will rip your heart out, said Ostur, and she held the bars. Moriarty's face tensed. Funny you should say that since I am about to do that to the tribunal leader right now. I intended it to be a private demonstration for Tichala and his wife, but I see that I must break your will, said Moriarty angrily, and he spread his wings. The prone body of the tribunal leader emerged from the darkness. Small orbs of light moved around the gigantic body like fireflies. The tribunal leader was on his back with his arms tucked to the sides. The body was covered with a golden armor up to the neck. The tribunal leader's three heads were separated from the body. The eye sockets were empty spaces. Ostur pounded the bars in protest. Moriarty it is best that you kill me now because I will kill you whenever the chance presents itself, she said. Shush, said Moriarty. Now Tichella and Ororo, this was the most powerful third-tier creature that ever existed in the multi and amalgamated universes. I don't care for the lecture, shouted Tichella. Send us back now. Moriarty ignored him. Look, he said and pointed at the body. Instantly the tribunal leader's body was torn apart in a slow manner. 
Ostuer wept loudly. Seventeen white blazing spheres that were the size of moons were inside of the tribunal leader's body. These spheres threw light on the cocoons that populated Spiria, cocoons that contained the bodies of the gods. Those spheres are the sources of his power, explained Moriarty. Tichal remained silent and he turned to Ostuer's prison. The Lady of the Light was on her knees as the grief of losing her love was more than she could bear. Aurora knelt in front of her and gave words of encouragement. We will help you get through this, said Aurora. I've never felt like this before, said Ostuer as tears ran down her cheeks. I feel like dying myself. What makes it worst is that the fight was the last memory I have of him. So sad, mocked White Wolf. Tichala turned sharply at him and wanted to tear the man to pieces. Come let us go to your living arrangements, said Moriarty as he turned to the Black Panther and Storm. The couple and the angel disappeared and reappeared in an architectural monstrosity. The house was haphazardously made from structures taken from different worlds. The lack of order in the construction made a maze that was lighted by small orbs that floated around the corridors and rooms. Arabic was written all over the interior of the structure. They are notes, said Ororo since she was familiar with the language. Moriarty was smaller and he stood at seven feet tall. He looked down at his captives with a softened expression. This was Yuza's home, said Moriarty. The couple ignored him. Yuza wrote extensively. I will get White Wolf to bring you writing materials, said Moriarty. He will also bring you food supplies and clothing. There are some coats in the other room. Yuza lived here until he died and then I buried him in Tunisia. One thing, said Tichella. Can you restore Ostuer to her higher form? Of course, Moriarty boasted. You think that I'm cruel. I really care about the third tiers. Aurora paused as she looked at a beautifully decorated green and gold book that was on a table. Tichella noticed her. What is it? he asked. Aurora opened the book and read the introduction. It tells of Yuza's life story, said Aurora. Moriarty walked around the couple. I never read it since I believed in his privacy. I will take my leave now, said Moriarty, and he disappeared. Aurora turned a few pages that were filled with Arabic and then she translated the words for Tichella. Chapter 3 My name is al Hajid Yuza. I was born in Tunisia and traveled most of the known world of Earth as I studied science. I became fascinated with the creator of the universe having come across so many stories about him from different cultures. I had my personal beliefs but I knew others thought differently. I wanted to find the common thread in our beliefs. I spent a considerable amount of time in France where my work on scientifically proving that God existed generated a great deal of interest. Firstly people found it strange that I would want to prove what was already known in such a spiritual country. Nevertheless I carried on with my work. Then I met a monk who identified himself as Moriarty the Angel. He offered me a chance to learn about the Creator and the Universe if I assisted his research on creatures that I never heard of. I accepted and was taken to this place called Spiria. The great light was the first thing that held my breath in Spiria. Light was everywhere and I shielded my eyes from it. Moriarty built a shelter for me and I was able to work. Yet I could not see outside since the great light blinded me. I asked about the source of the light and was informed that it came from the Creator. I desired to meet the Creator directly and Moriarty said that it would not be possible at that time. Meanwhile, I was given the opportunity to learn about creation which I will describe later. I want to deal with Moriarty at this point. The angel appeared to be a loner and an outcast. His desire to learn more about the third tier creatures, his classification, seemed strange to the general held human view of what angels did which was mainly to protect humans and serve the creator. 
Moriarty also does something that I find abhorrent as I have seen human scientists perform the same deed, that of kidnapping specimens. Moriarty brought two of the creatures in my abode for dissection. This was how I found out the reason that this place was called Spiria. Moriarty named it after the element that he discovered that was common in all the third-tier creatures. Despite my dislike of kidnapping and subsequent murder of specimens, I kept my mouth shut and looked on as Moriarty performed his examinations. He did not use cutting tools to open the human-looking creatures. Rather Moriarty simply stared at the bodies that floated and they were ripped apart. There was no blood or organs. A white orb would be in the center of the body pieces. Moriarty told me that the orb was the stem that created the body for the creature. He found that the orb created different species of the creatures. He also discovered that the more orbs within the creature the more powerful it tended to be. I made copious notes of the findings and gave my insights on the reasons that the orb could dictate shape, size, complexion, and abilities of the creatures. I inquired if such orbs were inside angels and Moriarty replied that he didn't know. That answer and subsequent observations led me to believe that Moriarty's knowledge was limited, hence his desire to learn. I assumed that the Creator did not impart all the knowledge of creation to the angel. One answer that I did get left me deeply curious and astonished about the nature of angels. I had inquired about the other tiers of classification. Moriarty revealed that as far as he knew mortals were on the fourth tier, angels of his type were the on the second tier, and angels of the type of Abaddon were the on first tier. The Creator was the father of all and above all so it would be pointless to create a class for him. Now I found Moriarty to be fantastically powerful and the thought that there were others more powerful than him left me in total awe. I was 45 years old when I came to Spiria and based on my records I am now 60. Immortality has crossed my mind yet it looks like such fortune will not fall on me as Moriarty stated he cannot perform that deed. I have documented 12,000 subspecies of the third tier creatures and CO discovered 1,800 elements. It was my hope to return to Earth with the body of knowledge collected, however Moriarty has objected to this. I asked for a reason and received no answer. I suggested he could take the writings to Earth and discreetly put it into circulation. He objected strongly to the information getting out. This secrecy worried me. Doubts grew in my mind about Moriarty's motive. I knew of only two types of angels and Moriarty had to fall in one of the categories despite his claims. As my conspiracy theory mind saw it Moriarty could use the information gathered to launch an attack on the third tier creatures in the form of genocide. I knew that this was mad speculation having spent so long in Spiria. Still I kept a suspicious eye on Moriarty's activities. He internalized the discoveries and his ability to draw conclusions intrigued me. As a person who associated glorious miracles with angels I was at times left in amazement with the scientific approach taken by Moriarty. I also learned that creation was a precise exercise executed by the Creator. Moriarty gave the example of Earth's moon which is precisely in the correct orbit and size to influence the Earth. I was told of cells in my body that degenerated and regenerated in an orderly pattern per second. These insights strengthened my conviction that creation was well planned. But did the plan come from past trial and error I could not say, even Moriarty was unsure. I now come to an event that changed my experience in Spiria and when the fear of destruction came on me. I was awakened from my rest when the house shook violently. I heard angry voices outside of the walls. Moriarty's voice mingled with the shouts of others. But I didn't understand the language that was used by the speakers. The house shook again and I heard the sounds of a scuffle. Something large and heavy slammed into the right side of the house. I feared that the structure would have collapsed. Luckily the walls stayed intact. The shouting and the fighting continued. Then the altercation ended abruptly. Moriarty appeared inside the house and he was extremely crossed. 
I inquired on what transpired outside and I was told that it was nothing to worry about. Moriarty merely commanded a wall to open, and at first I shaded my eyes in expectation of the great light, then I noticed that outside was dark. Where had the light gone? Moriarty was not forthcoming to my questions. I threatened to withdraw my assistance until the matter was settled. Eventually Moriarty gave in. He revealed that the visitors were of the Fallen and they wanted his knowledge of the third-tier creatures. Moriarty refused and a fight ensued, he won. But he expected them to return and in larger numbers. So he concealed Spiria. For some time I doubted whether Moriarty's answers were true or not. Since I could not verify the veracity of the statements my suspicion of Moriarty grew. With the light gone, I left the house frequently and was carried on thick frozen sheets to wherever Moriarty wanted to take me in the new environment. Moriarty brought in larger creatures that would not normally fit in the house. And so my work continued of dissection and examination of brain functions, nervous systems, and regeneration, all can be seen in the later notes. Yet the thought that the other angels could return frightened me. I never slept comfortably since the incident. I pondered on what the fallen angels looked like. Were they the scary creatures that I learned in lore? And how many would return? Would it be all the fallen angels? I shivered with the thought. Soon I realized that Moriarty probably didn't want my notes to be discovered by the other angels on Earth. I started to think about the Creator and his involvement or non-involvement in these matters. Then I did something that I believed would end my torment. I prayed silently for answers and protection. No answers came. However, the other angels never returned. Was that due to prayer? I don't have the answer. Chapter 4 Aurora showed Tichala the pages filled with diagrams of the creatures that were examined. Several of the beings were beastly, they seemed to be concoctions of different entities fused together in one body. Eyes were where eyes should not be, heads and limbs were sometimes absent and when present they appeared in a variety of shapes and numbers. I've seen enough, said Tichala. Isn't your scientific mind at least curious to see more, asked Ororo. I only care about you, our family and our country. I have no taste for scientific discovery if it jeopardizes the people that I care about, replied Tichala. We can call on the Creator, suggested Ororo. Do you think he will hear us? It's worth a try, said Ororo, and she closed the book. The house shook violently for a moment and it reminded Tichala of Yuza's experience. There was a foreboding silence and then Moriarty appeared. You have to leave now, said Moriarty in a serious manner. We aren't leaving without Ostur, said Ororo. The roof was torn off and the couple saw a beam of diagonal light that came out of what appeared to be a crack in Spiria's ceiling. It is too late, said Moriarty they have found me. Indeed we have, said an angel as he came over the house. Tichala realized that the angel was an identical twin of Moriarty. Six other angels and with similar appearances appeared around the house. The towering beings stared dishearteningly at Moriarty, Ororo, and Tichala. You didn't expect to take all the third-tier beings from the multiverses for yourself and nobody would notice, said the angel. But this is beneficial to us since we don't have to search for these creatures to use them. Who are they Moriarty? asked Tichala. The Fallen, replied Moriarty. You even have humans here, said the Angel. They too can be useful to us. Moriarty, said Ororo. Give me back my abilities. I didn't take that them away. There is nothing in here for you to manipulate said Moriarty, and flew up to the intruders. Moriarty grew into a giant like his brothers. Without warning, Moriarty was attacked by the six fallen. Let's try to find Ostur while they fight, said Tichala. He lifted Ororo in his arms, 
he skillfully ran up the wall and leapt through the opening. The couple landed on the jagged plate of ice that the house rested on. Meanwhile the scuffle with Moriarty and the Fallen drifted away. Moriarty took a pounding from the fists of his brothers. Where is White Wolf? Ororo asked. Maybe he has already gone back to Earth, said Tichala. Can you see Ostur's prison? No, replied Ororo. Then she shouted at Moriarty. Free Ostur and she can save the others. Tichala was unsure if Moriarty heard, if really did care about the Third Tears then he would respond. Suddenly a bright light appeared in the distance. Ostur, Tichala shouted instinctively. The new light shot towards the house and dimmed as it came nearer. It was Ostur. She noticed the battle and then focused on the couple. Ostur take us and the others out of here, said Ororo. What about Moriarty? asked Ostur. Leave him, responded Tichala. And we must leave before his attackers realize what has happened. Ostur hesitated due to her need for vengeance. Ostur you cannot defeat them, we have to go now, said Ororo. There are too many gods. I cannot take all of them, said Ostur. Then take what you can, said Ororo. The Lady of the Light extended her arms and the group was teleported out of Spiria along with the Asgardians, the Olympians, and others. The realm of the Elder Gods the group emerged out of the teleportation in Ostur's home. A sheikh was in the empty council chamber, having been unable to reach Ostur. Ostur you're alive, said a sheikh, and she ran to her friend. Ostur held her and said, we don't have much time. I have to awaken my son so that he can guard this place while we return the stolen gods to their rightful worlds. Ororo looked on in wonder since a sheikh was a splitting image of her. The Wind Rider had seen the woman in her dreams, but didn't know her identity. Who are you? asked Ororo. A sheikh was unsure why the question was asked. I'm a sheikh, your ancestor, she replied. Aurora went to her and they embraced. I don't remember you, said the Wind Rider. That is right, said Ostur, and I promise to help return your memories. Ostur placed her hand on Aurora's head. This should do it, said the Queen of the Elder Gods. A moment passed and Aurora still had no recollection of a shake. It did not work, said Aurora. Then I must find another way of repaying you, said Ostur. You don't have to repay us, said Ororo as she held Tichala's arm. You should concentrate on protecting your kin. Ostur conceded that Ororo was correct. But you can teleport us to Wakanda, said Tichala. In a blink, the couple was in their house. That's when Ororo realized that she still had Yuza's book. She made to inform Tichala but he was on his kamoyo. Are you calling Shuri and Umba? asked Ororo. No. I'm linking to the satellites to scan for the homing beacons on the cosmic absorber and the glove, replied a focused Tichala. And the reading is that the items are in London. That's where White Wolf will also be.